Okay, good morning. Welcome the survivor of the of the lecture. Okay, I hope you survive well. Okay, so let me recap what we did yesterday. So um, yesterday we left the lecture at um, of the discussion of the classical moduli space of uh, supersymmetric QCD. Um, so today we continue analyzing this uh, this uh, vacua, basically, of this theory. It's classical vacua. So you remember yesterday we derived this uh, equation of motion of the theory. This is known as a uh, D-term equation. Okay. So uh, one feature I would like to emphasize uh, here is that there are two different nature of equation of motions. I think I, think I should have mentioned, but... Okay, let's uh, everyone going in and I will continue. Okay, this is important message. So generically, if your theory has a um, gauge multiplet, it comes with a d-auxiliary field. Okay, this is vector multiplet. And if you have chiral field, it comes with f-term, the f-auxiliary field. You can uh, get the equation of motion by uh, do the variation of the action with respect to f or with respect to d. Okay? This is why it's called f and d term. Now the f term, we emphasize this many times, is that you get it and it's become the derivative of a superpotential respect to chiral field. You remember this, right? Superpotential is holomorphic. You take derivative with the field. It will become an equation. A, a complex equation equal to zero, okay? This is the nature of the F term. On the other hand, if you look at this D term, it's not a complex equation, it's a real equation because you have Q dagger Q, this equal to that, okay? So this is the nature that F term is a complex equation and then you have a real equation, okay? This I want to emphasize. <coughs> so. Now, in order to solve the term equation, one thing that you could do on the spot is to use the gauge and flavor rotation to put Q and Q tilde into this form, okay? So remember that Q and Q tilde has two indices, right? So look at Q first. Uh, let me remind you, A and B run from one to one to NC, I and J run from one to and F, this from last time. So this is color indices, and these are flavor indices, okay? So you can view Q as uh, an F by NC matrix, okay? This is uh, first of all. And you can use both, you have to use both gauge and flavor rotation to put them in, the, you can put them in this form. So it's a kind of diagonal, but this is not square matrix, okay? It's an NF by NC matrix with this element in the diagonal component. So in this case, I'm considered NF less than NC. So my matrix has the NF rows, NC column. And since NC is a bit, it's, it's, it's larger, so you should view this as a larger in that way. I don't know how to, <laughs> how to draw it, okay? So once you do this, you can do it for the, for the Q tilde. And you solve this equation, and you see that because the right-hand side, A and B, run from 1 to NC, there will be some zero, right? So it forced R to be zero here. So this solved the equation. What are these guys? Basically, these guys are like vacuum expectation value that we can give to this uh, matrix, okay? And if we give the generic expectation value, it works like in a usual quantum field theory that you learn from Peskin and Schroeder. If you give vacuum expectation value to matter field, what happened? It hicks the gauge symmetry, <coughs> right? This is the usual Higgs mechanism, except that we do it in supersymmetric context. So generically, generically means that you take A1 up to A and F to be generic value. In general, they're not equal, they're greater than zero, Okay, so this generically uh, breaks the gauge group S, U, and C 
to SU NC minus NF. Okay? Now, the next part is to compute what is left over after Higgs mechanism, right? So you break the gauge group, of course, then there will be a broken generator. What happened? The vector field become massive, right? This is uh, what you learn in standard Higgs mechanism. So now let me explain. In supersymmetry, it's not just vector field become massive, it's the whole vector multiplet that become massive because supersymmetry rotate the vector field with gauge geno. So if the gauge field become massive, gauge geno has to become massive also because they are in the same multiplet. Otherwise, you break supersymmetry. Okay, but we preserve supersymmetry. Therefore, the whole vector multiplet become massive. Okay, so we can compute the leftover, the, the, okay. the leftover massless degree of freedom after the Higgs mechanism mechanism Okay, as follows. Right, so originally, we have 2NC times NF degree of freedom of scalar. in the Tyro multiplet. Q and Q tilde. Do you agree that there are in total 2NC times an NF complex degree of freedom? Uh, yes. Let me put complex here. This is com important. Why? Because look at the Q. Which index it carry? It carry color and flavor, right? So one is NC, this, the other is NF. Okay, so from Q there is NC times NF. For Q tilde, there are also NC times NF. So there in total, this amount of degree of freedom in the Cairo. Okay, this you agree? Second, the gauge symmetry. is broken from SUNC to SUNC minus NF. So the so how many broken generator you have here? So there are NC squared minus one. This is dimension of SUNC. Do you agree? minus S U N C minus N F square minus one. This is the second one. This is number of total broken generator. You agree? In Higgs mechanism. You compute this and you simplify, you get two N C N F minus N F square. This number of degree of freedom Cairo multiplet <laughs> are eaten by vector multiplet which then become massive Okay, so the vector multiplet become massive. So now, what's the leftover? The 
the number of massless complex degree of freedom is 2nc times nf minus this number, right? This is the leftover after being eaten by the vector multiplier. So you have nf square degree of freedom that is left over. So why do we care about leftover? Because these guys parameterize the low energy effective theory, right? These are massless degree of freedom. The massive one, you, you have a separation of scale. These become massive. This is usual, like in, in Higgs mechanism. This is the light degree of freedom that has control your dynamics in infrared. OK? Yes, yes. I have to give vacuum expectation value to Q and Q to the dagger in this form, which satisfy my equation of motion. Okay? Once I do that, this is important because it has to satisfy equation of motion, which is the D terms. Once you do that, this follows. Okay? So what is this quantity? This quantity has a name. This is called the dimension of moduli space. So we say that the dimension, the complex dimension of the moduli space of vacua which I denote by M and F less than N C. And let me put CL here to mean classical, OK? And I use this notation, and I put C here to emphasize that I count everything in complex unit, OK? This is so important because people usually confuse that. Are, are you doing in real unit or in complex unit? I'm doing in complex unit, OK? Equal to NF square. Good. So what I'm showing is that. Right. After the Higgs mechanism and so on, I have leftover massless NF square massless degree of freedom in my vacuum. This is a, a some complex space with dimension NF square. Okay. So now the question is, how do I parameterize this space? This is my ground state, basically, classical ground state of my theory. Then to parameterize it, a suitable parameterization of this space is in term so massless gauge invariant quantities Right? Because if you have a non gauge invariant, it is not physical. We want to parameterize downstream ground state using a physical object, so it has to be gauge invariant. Which gauge invariant can you use to parameterize NF degree of freedom? It turned out to be the bilinear of the cube, okay? which is we call meson. Oh, by the way, yesterday there was a question why I call it Q. This is quark. Q tilde, we call it anti, anti quark, okay? So this is M. Look at the index. It's uh, contain IJ. Let me. So Q A I Q tilde J A. Okay. Put J here and I here. Okay. This combination is called mesons. Okay. And you can see that. It has two indices, okay? NF by NF. So generically, you have NF square degree of freedom. This match, this precisely, okay?
So are you fine with this? If this is fine, I will move on to the second case when NF is greater than or equal to NC. Okay. So let me just erase like this. So you can do the same game. However, now you see that the, the game was the game changed a little bit because when you rotate, now the matrix get bigger, right? On the on this the other side. Previously, I do it in the NF times NC matrix, and I feel because of the NC is greater than NF, so I feel in one direction. Here is another one. So you can use gauge and flavor rotation again to put matrix in, in this form. This is NF uh, times NC matrix. Okay. So now I rotate it like this, A1 up to, uh, let me, A2 up to A and C, okay? Because now there is, the rest are zero here, you see? Because NF is now bigger, okay? And then, again, the Q to the dagger can be rotated like A1 tilde, A2 tilde, up to A and C tilde. Again, this is an F times N C matrix. Okay? Now my A and A tilde has to satisfy <coughs> AI mod square minus AI tilde square equal to R independent of I. Let's use well, K here maybe. Okay, again, we can use the same argument here. So generically, now you see that NF is uh, bigger, and you give vacuum expectation value of all NC, you see? So, but you have SUNC gauge group, and you give web to all of them. So they're completely broken. So generically, this break the gauge group, SUNC, completely. Okay, so this is the modification number one. Again, let's compute the massless degree of freedom. So number of massless degree of freedom, you can start from, again, 2NC times NF. This doesn't change, okay, because Q give NC and F, Q tilde give NC and F, so they're in total, this number. The gauge symmetry is broken completely. So, well, this basically get broken completely. Yes, so there are E10 degree of freedom and so on, okay? So we can skip to number three, right? So basically, you just replace this part by the number of broken, right, generator, which you have in total, the dimension of this guy. You agree with me? And this is equal to, yeah, this number. This is the dimension of our moduli space. Since the complex dimension of moduli of vac moduli space of vacua is this guy. 2 and F and C minus N C squared minus 1. Okay? Now, this is getting more complicated than the previous case. You just don't have NF square. It's not so clear anymore how to do this, this thing, okay? But, again, a suitable parameterization for this guy is still similar, okay? There is, of course, the Mason. Mason is always there because it doesn't matter whether NF greater than NC or not, you can form this gauge invariant combination. But in addition to Mason, 
there are more objects now. Can anyone guess what they are? Barium, yes. So, again, a suitable parameterization. Now, gauge invariance. Uh, quantities are uh, meson mji equal to qia q tilde ja okay this is what we call meson there's a baryon which is carry i up to nc okay with the epsilon contraction of a1 a2 up to A and C, Q, uh, A1, I1, up to Q, A and C, I and C. Okay. There is also anti baryon, which you form I and C equal to epsilon A1, A2, up to A and C. Q I one A one tilde up to Q tilde I N C A N C. These are gauge invariant quantity that you have. Okay, in this theory. Now these are not independent of each other. It satisfies some complicated relation. You can imagine how. I'm not going to go into detail here. This is a problem of classical contraction of epsilon going to delta. So you can multiply certain combination of B and B tilde, right? And then you become several M, for example. This is possible because of this epsilon. So let me do one case for you. So let me comment it here, OK? I'm not going to do this thing in detail. You can look at my note if you want to see a precise relation. Okay, between M and but I will just make this comment. Okay. Uh, these quantity are subject to various relation. So they're not independent of each other. And this is why this makes this uh, modular space become complicated because there's a relation among relation. Okay? But let me give you one example. Let's take NF equal to NC, the limiting case. This is a nice case where I can show things in front of you explicitly. Okay? So you will see that if NF equal to NC, this contraction, just anti, uh, remember that this run from 1 to NF, right? Each indices of this. So if NF equal to NC, you can, this is basically a singlet, right? Because this total is symmetric in NC indices over 1 to NC now. OK, you agree with this? So I can write down. Uh, star F, well, you can do the Hodge star. This is basically will be defined as this one. 1 over NC factorial. Oh, let me write it here. Factorial. Uh, epsilon I1 up to I. So let me use uh, one variable here, right? NC up to B. Um, I1 up to I N C and similarly for B star I over also do this thing. Uh, I have problem lower and rising in this system. NC, one up to I N C then this should be lower. Okay, and then there's a single relation. Determinant of M 
equal to uh, minus star b star b tilde equal to zero. This is a classical relation I, I mentioned. They're not independent. Okay? <coughs> and if you count number of degree of freedom, this is an exercise for you guys. Set nf equal to nc, and you see that the degree of freedom of meson and baryon, subject to one precisely one relation, satisfy this dimension of moduli space. Okay? This is an easy case you can do explicitly on the board. The other case is complicated. Okay. Now, let me make some comments. We're almost done with the classical moduli space. So first of all, you will see that this equation, for example, has a singularity at the origin, right? Meaning that you should view this also most like a picture that people usually draw. It looks like a cone, right? And this has a, a singular point at the origin, okay? So this is uh, one thing about classical moduli space. It has singularity. Whenever you have singularity in the vacuum space, it tells you that at that point, there should be extra massless degree of freedom. This is the, the usual interpretation, okay? This is number one. But let me also comment that the, in the next topic, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna look at quant not just classical, we're gonna quantize this theory and look at quantum moduli space. Quantum moduli space can be drastically different from the classical moduli space, okay? For example, let me tell you what we're going to see. This equation, the singularity of the origin, of, at the origin, will be removed by quantum effect. This is the number one. And if you remember the case of NF less than NC, there is NF square uh, dimension moduli space. Do you remember? We derived earlier parametrized by Meson. In quantum theory, this is wiped out. So whatever you solve in classical equation of motion, which is not true in quantum theory. In quantum theory, there's not even a vacuum. So this is uh, quite, quite uh, dramatic. The quantum effect can wipe out whatever you compute in the classical regime. So I will show that to you, okay? But this is a quantum theory. So first thing we have to understand is to understand classical theory, and then we move on to quantum. Okay, so I think uh, I'm ending my discussion on the classical part. So now I will move to the quantum part, okay, of the supersymmetric QCD. Yeah. Ah, moduli space means that they're parameterized by the vacuum expectation value of these guys. Yeah, so when these guys get vacuum expectation value, you can go in any direction. This is the precisely this direction, right? Like, look at NF square. NF square is very easy to see. NF square, you have NF, NF, NF square direction, right? And this that's by VEF of each component of MIJ, for example, right? This is what I mean by uh, moduli space, okay? But you have to use an object which is gauge invariant, otherwise it's not a physical quantity, okay? Okay, perfect. So, yeah, that's why it's important to, to, to do it in uh, two cases when NF uh, less than NC and NF greater than, N, uh, greater than or equal to NC. Physics of these two cases are very different, okay? So now let's do quantum theory. Okay, the quantum theory. So first of all, we have to discuss anomaly, of course. Anomalous and non-anomalous global U1 symmetries. This is almost the first quantity we can compute. OK? 
Okay. So recall the classical symmetry. So now we focus only on global part, okay? So you have SUNF1, SUNF2, U1B, and U1A. Okay, you remember the table of charge? So Q is in NF, singlet, singlet, NF bar, okay? This you remember. If you not, draw this picture and read it from there. Okay, the baryonic symmetry, well, it's one here minus one here because this can form baryon and this can form antibaryon, right? And U1A act on this equally. And re recall that there's also an R symmetry, which we call U1X, right? U1X have to give charge one to KG, you know, because otherwise it cannot be called R symmetry. Okay, this is lambda goes to e to the i alpha lambda. To psi, you remember this has charge minus one, right? Because we give zero to the to the chiral field, so it rotate like this, and psi tilde rotate like that. This is from last time. Okay, good. So now we can kind of compute anomaly. But what is entered in anomaly is the is basically the um, the fermionic part, right? That uh, in this in this. So let me summarize in another table for you. The U one, okay? So you have U one A, U one B, and U one X. Okay? So you have psi, psi tilde, and lambda. Okay? This carry charge one. 1, 0. Of course, axial symmetry doesn't act on gauge geno. It's act only on quarks, okay? Because vector multiplet doesn't charge under this, okay? U1B, this is 1 minus 1, 0, as it's the, the Q component, okay? Because they're transformed together. U1X act on this as minus 1, minus 1, and plus 1, okay? Now I'm going to show you that this symmetry and this symmetry is anomalous. Okay, how do we show that? There are many methods we can show that. One of the convenient ones that I like is to use path integral. Okay, this you have done, so I'm going to do it again because this is a very in instructive example. Okay, so suppose that we look at U1X symmetry. Let's look uh, at U1X. U1X look uh, most instructive, right? So I'm going to compute this in front of you. So yes, so the shift in the path integral is due to all the fermion I list here. So you write this, and you do the shift as I did last time. OK, exponential. I alpha over 16 pi square integral d4x fa fb f tilde b now times the big bracket which I will write it now okay good so this you see that this will depends on you the intuition you have is that you couple two current with the another current right that charge under u1x there are three guys that charge under it. First, let's do KG, no? So KG, no, is in trace of A, trace A, trace B, in the adjoint representation. So the first term is due to KG, no? The lambda, okay? And then you have the carry charge plus one. So the coefficient there is plus one. So if you want, I can be very explicit here put a plus sign here. Let's do the psi, it carry minus 
Okay? Trace A, B, A, trace B in the fundamental representation. Okay? Minus, this is another minus sign. This is due to, let's say, psi. Okay? Trace T, A, T, B, anti fundamental, anti fundamental. And I run out of my space. I don't know how to close bracket. So here <laughs> and here. Okay. This is due to <coughs> sine theta. At this stage, do you agree? This is how you compute anomaly in general. Okay. <coughs> this. Let's do this bracket. Is equal to. You remember what this is? This is, has a name, it's called Dinkin Index, right? So it becomes T of a joint minus T of fundamental minus T of anti fundamental delta AB. You remember this, uh, we, this identity, we did it for the first time when we introduced non abelian gauge theory. Okay, now you can plug the values in. Right. So what is this? T of a joint is N C right? And this is one half. This is one half. Uh, oh, I should remind you, there are, um, yeah, I missed uh, one thing because look at this, there are NF flavor of that. I should insert this NF here. I should insert NF here, okay? So this NF over 2, NF over 2, NF, NF, this number, okay? So you see that the, the thing is NC minus um, and F. Right. <laughs> Two and C minus. Yes. Okay. There is some typo in the in the note, but this is correct. And look at this case, for example. It's non-zero. Okay. If this is non-zero, this means that. The shift in the part integral measure is non-zero. You agree? If the shift in part integral is non-zero, this means that this is anomalous, right? But wouldn't you uh, absorb that shift in a shift from the complex part of the coupling? Uh, you can do, but this is anomalous. I'm just showing you that uh, whether you can absorb or not, that's out of the question now. What I'm doing is that it's like you can absorb the shift in theta angle. But that's not the point. The point is that any anomalous, you can absorb it. That, that's a statement, right? You can, but this is still anomalous. Anomalous symmetry is, by definition, anything that can change part integral measure. What I'm showing you is that this changes the part integral measure. Therefore, it's anomalous. Whether you can absorb it, that's another story. But it's anomalous. It's like when you, I say that you want R is anomalous. I just show you that, fine, it changed in the part integral measure. So you agree with me that the U1 R is anomalous? Well, at this step, I haven't done anything. I just show you that this is, this is anomalous. This is anomalous. So exercise is to compute this, OK, and show that it's non-zero. If you want, you can show also that this is zero. Can you see why immediately? by just stare at this. Look, this doesn't have the, this term. This comes with opposite sign, so they cancel. So this is non-anomalous. You agree? This comes with this sign, with plus sign. This comes with this sign, with plus sign. So they're non-zero. So this is anomalous. So let me summarize for you, if you want. Uh, I can put a table here. 
And this would satisfy what you ask. Shift in theta. This turn out to be 2nf, 0, and 2nc minus nf, 2nf. This answer your question? Yeah, you can shift it in theta, but it, it means it's anomalous. OK, yeah. 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 No. But that's why these. Okay. What I'm telling you is that these are. Yeah. Of course, you cannot. Abs now, now there's no one. Previously, there's one, right? Now there are two of them. So you cannot do shift in theta to compensate both. That's that's true. What you said. But uh, I'm I'm declaring that this is uh, this is uh, both of them just anomalous. Now the trick to make only one become anomalous is to take combinations such that and define another current which is become non-anomalous. That what we call non-anomalous U1R. Okay, but this is next step. So bear with me. What I'm, at the moment not to confuse you is that I show you that shift in path integral measure give two nf here and give you two nc minus. 2nf here and give you 0 here. This is purely this computation. Okay? Yeah, in my note, uh, in front of T fundamental, there should be nf in the front, but I will, I will correct this. This is the typo, okay? Because there are nf fermion. nf fermion here. Okay, so what can we conclude from this blackboard? What can we, what we can conclude is that U1A and U1X are anomalous, whereas U1B is anomaly free. Okay? So for those of you who did a bit of QCD, you will remember that axial current is anomalous. This is fine. Now we have so-called a candidate R symmetry, which we proposed in a rough way earlier. It's turned out to be anomalous because we don't know quantum mechanics at that time. Now we do quantum theory, we're gonna fix it. Right? And then U1B is what you call baronic symmetry. This is always anomaly free. So it's consistent with what you learn in normal quantum field theory. Now I'm gonna fix the U1X, okay? We can define Oh, and for those of you who wonder why there are a factor of two in the front, because we normalize the shift in theta angle to be twice of this guy, okay? This is, remember, that rotate by alpha, this corresponds to shift by two alpha. This is why it's two in the front, so don't get panicked, okay? <laughs> right. We can define an anomaly free R symmetry by taking, of course, we, are, we just take the combination such that the rotation is zero, right? Such that the shift in theta angle is zero. So, which combination? So, you just define R to be x plus nf minus nc over nf times a. Or if you don't, I uh, can write it better. U1R to be U1X plus this factor times U1A. This is going to be the candidate for the non-anomaly, non-anomalous U1R. So let me ask you first, do you agree with this? So look at this table. Plug the 2NF in here. 
and put the, this thing in, so you see that it's the, road, the shift in theta angle is zero, right? So this is anomaly free. Of course, this is one candidate of the R symmetry, you can, you can, you can say. And this is the uh, anomaly free R symmetry. Yes, so, so U1A in this picture is still anomalous. Okay. Now instead of using U1X and declare it as an R symmetry, call it U1R, and then this anomaly free. Okay? So what I show you is that in this theory, there is one choice of anomaly free R symmetry. Okay? And now you understand why I use U1X. <laughs> Because I don't like it, yes. I want to preserve the name R for the non-anomalous non symmetry, right? So this is the reason. But OK. And now, I think your question from the beginning of my lecture should be clear. Why in classical theory, I told you many times, you feel free to choose whatever value you want, OK? In quantum theory, no. In quantum theory, there is more restriction than if you want the symmetry to be anomaly free, it kind of fix you what you have to do. Okay? Of course, you can say that at this stage, is this unique? Not, not yet that uh, you can declare this as a as unique choice. But then, let me mention you further that once we go to a special class of theory known as superconformal view theory, superconformal symmetry will fix this thing uniquely. But at this stage, I can declare you that this is one candidate we can have. Okay? So, yeah. But usually people already use candidate, this candidate to do a lot of physics, okay? But since you already found the non anomaly, non asymmetry, this is already good. Okay, so now let me retabulate the whole table again. Okay? So. Now, if I compute the R charge of psi equal to R charge of psi tilde, will be N minus NC over NF, as you can see from this table. And R of the gauge genome is really one, as we required also. So it's, it's really good to call this R symmetry. Now, it follows that. This RQ also equal to RQ tilde <coughs> equal to 1 minus NC over NF. You agree? It's a bosonic component. You just put at 1 into this. Now let's retabulate the thing. Uh, okay. <coughs> so these are anomalous. I hate it. Okay, I erase it. <laughs> so let's do this thing. You want R? This is NF minus. Okay, let's write it like that. Okay. So this is a symmetry of the quantum theory. This is quantum symmetry now. Okay. And now you can work out the charge for meson and baryons easily, right? So meson was just a composite of this, QQ tilde. So it has our charge twice of this, OK? Baryon, you multiply NC of this. So it has NC times this, OK? And anti-baryon is similar. So you can work out everything, including the gauge invariant, just from this table, OK? Uh, right. Now there is a, one important R charge, which uh, I should mention. Okay. So you, what's the one loop beta function coefficient of this theory? You remember we worked it out some lecture ago. It's 3nc minus nf. 
This, if this is non-zero, immediately you generate a big lambda. You remember? Because of one loop exactness. Okay, so let, let me write that down. Okay. Okay, you remember this, right? So this is lambda to the three n c minus n f. Okay, and as a homework, you should work out because these are the background field, so it carry all the charges, right? So you should work out this table as follows: that lambda three n c minus n f. Again, you n f two times U1B times U1R and there is a anomalous U1A since this doesn't carry index it's 1 it's 1 right doesn't have a color or flavor index so baryon and this doesn't uh, coming from quarks at all so this is 0 this is a non-anomalous but it charge on the anomalous symmetry being 2 and F this you can work out using the method I gave you, okay? One important part is that even though you want A is anomalous, sometimes it's useful to keep track of this because you can use this to constrain some dynamics as much as we did in the non-renormalization theorem, right? You, when you use a symmetry to constrain the dynamic, we don't care whether this is anomalous or non-anomalous. It's like we did it like to tabulate all the field like that. Okay, so we will see this uh, point later. Good. So, are there any questions about the uh, anomal anomaly of the U1 symmetries? Uh, where should I? When did we start? An hour ago. Okay, so past 11. Okay, so it's almost one hour. Yeah, we can have 10 minutes break and we can come back and then. We're going to do another very important topic, uh, which is the NSVZ beta function. Okay? Um, yeah, let's have a, have a break for now, and we come back in, in 10 minutes. Okay? Okay, uh, let me recap for some of you who doesn't want to see the path integral, but want to see anomaly from the triangle diagram. Here is an easy explanation. Okay? When you compute triangle diagram, this is a triangle diagram that you have. You put fermion running in the loop, okay? And this is two current that you, well, they have to have three vertex that you have to compute. This is why it's triangle diagram, okay? So now the diagram that we are interested in was the gauge, gauge, whatever, global symmetry that you compute. Now, if you remember, anomaly coefficient has to be trace of the T3 of the generator, okay? Here is turn out to be abelian. So what you do is that you compute trace of Ta in the, in for fermion that charge under the representation Ri. Tb, this comes from this corner. And since this is U1, it's a U1 charge. Okay? So in my example, you have U1 x charge to be 
for psi, psi bar, uh, psi tilde and lambda, this u1 x to be minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So how do we do it? So you look at this representation. So this turned out to be, the AB turned out to be a delta AB, okay? You factor it out, okay? Here, you start doing, let's start from the lambda, then you have T adjoint. This guy gives you T adjoint. This guy, this guy gives you charge plus one, okay? Now you have minus sign from these two guys and there are nf of them. So this is the t fundamental, and then nf of t anti fundamental. OK? So this is what I did, basically. If you feel like you don't like path integral, you can just compute this coefficient, and you are done, basically. If it's 0, non-anomalous. If it's, if it's non-zero, it's anomalous. That's it. So this is how you view it from triangle diagram. Okay, I hope it's clear. Uh, if you need a reference, this is Peskin and Schroeder. When you compute anomaly in standard model and this kind of thing, yeah, this is uh, going to be important. Okay. So, right, but we really need it to to for the for the for the rest of the lecture also. This will appear again when we do cyber duality and so on, okay? So if you haven't learned it, you better do it now. I mean, uh, yeah. It's a very in important concept in uh, quantum field theory. So yeah, please, please learn it. Okay. Right, so now we're gonna move on to, this is another complicated topic, it's quite subtle. Um, so yes, this is about some beta function that uh, when you have theory with, well, also with gauge field only or with matter, okay? So recall, well, I will divide this uh, for, pedag for the pedagogical purpose. It's best to divide this theory into, to divide the uh, teaching into two parts. So let's consider, first let's consider. For the n equal to one, pure super young yields first. You understand what I'm doing, okay? So at the moment I can tell you that this is some beta function, okay? So recall the Lagrangian. This you have seen about a million times. Lagrangian, okay. D2 theta, I over 16 pi, tau W A, V W A, V, okay. You have the alpha index. You can contract them plus complex conjugate. Okay. And uh, WA is defined as usual, okay? So if you want, I can write it again. This we have seen, where is the basically in super few notation. This is just the der uh, derivative of the, of the E to the V, okay? And V is the vector super field. And if you remember, this tour, I tell you many times, really run at one loop. Okay, so fine. This is not a problem for us. However, G does run. Okay? And it's uh, also crucial to compute even that uh, how G, G is the, the gauge coupling that lived inside the tor. The upper, our goal is to determine how G run. Okay? But before doing that, you have to define how do you write the Lagrangian. Okay? So we can work, we can also work with the canonically, canonically normalized kinetic term.
okay, of this type. Okay, with the W A alpha G V W A alpha G V plus complex conjugate. Okay, so what is this notation compared to this notation? This notation basically, if you remember the G, the V that we the bottom component is the V is the gauge field contract with the sigma mu. Okay, it's A mu sigma mu. Now you want to put G inside the, the A. Okay, and you normalize your action in this way. The goal is that this become real superfield. Okay, this become real superfield, and this guy can run. Okay, so the goal. So now we see. Let me put C here. C stands for canonical. Okay, this is how you. Yeah. This is d bar square. And the next one? D bar alpha. Oh, you mean the. <coughs> it has alpha and alpha balance. D bar square. Uh, no, 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 no. It's d bar in one, d bar in the other. Look at the, the note. Okay, so I will denote this by Vc. Vc is a real vector field. Vector super field. G is real and physical. Okay. Note that this Lagrangian is no longer holomorphic in the combination. 1 over g square minus i theta over 8 pi square. This is a crucial point. I would like to emphasize this point. So if you choose to normalize Vc in this way, so multiply g inside, so you have g stick in front of your gauge field. Okay? In this normalization, you destroy holomorphicity in tor. Because now you split part, the real part, the, the, this part of it, into here. So it's no longer holomorphic in this guy, clearly, right? Because you split the, this part inside here and here. OK? So in this normalization, the goal is to determine how G runs. The goal is to determine how the coupling G runs in this formalism. So meaning we can compute beta function of this G. Okay? Again, the computation here is uh, quite nice. It's um, due to certain anomaly also. So I'm going to, again, use the path integral method. This, by the way, this, okay, so to compute the beta function for G, okay? The first group of people who did this is Novikov, Schiffman, Weinstein, and Sakharov. This is uh, why this beta function is called NSVC beta function. It's computed in reference 23, meaning that this is computed in 83. Okay. But the method that they use is uh, not so transparent. And I'm going to follow 
the another method which is more modern this is due to Nima Akani Hamed yes Nima and Murayama in uh, 20 reference 24 which is the presentation that they published in 97 you can see the gap <laughs> this is the understanding that developed in supersymmetric gauge theory that uh, because the presentation that I give you give the clearer picture of how to derive this thing okay and you might ask why there is such a huge gap in the literature of modern presentation and the first time that uh, this result was derived because there is some subtlety that people don't understand about this canonical normalize and this formalism basically okay so let's proceed from there okay so changing from G from V to G times VC. So I denote the subscript C just to tell you, just to emphasize that this is different from this. Okay, I normalize G in the inside. This is is called canonically normalized. Okay, transform <coughs> the path integral as follows. I'm sorry for those of you who not familiar with anomaly it's this re keep repeating itself again and again and again so you better study it if you're not familiar with this okay so you start from this uh, function this uh, action d2 theta tau over 4 pi i w a alpha v w a alpha v plus complex conjugate okay this is my path integral. Of course, I can feel free to write this as, okay, stare carefully, I'm not gonna write another line. I can write this as G of VC. I can change this to G of VC. And I can change G of VC. Okay? This is just changing a variable universally. Now, of course, if I say this is equal to d, uh, integral, d of vc, if I remove the g from here, I will get Jacobian because I do some change of variable. Okay? This Jacobian turn out to be this guy. T times a joint over 8 pi square log Z of W W A alpha G V C W A of G of alpha G V C plus complex conjugate uh, can you read my handwriting here Yes, uh, I'll, I'll define it. Okay, one second. Yes, you see, when you pass, this is the usual Jacobian that you coming from change of variable, you see. So, this is the anomaly type, right? So, this is anomaly type because my VC is in the vector multiplet. This is why I get T a joint. This is normalization that I usually use, the 8 pi square. Then this is the wave function renormalization that I get. Okay? This is very special wave function renormalization. It's a wave function renormalization of the Gecino multiplet, which basically you can read off how you normalize. Okay? This guy sometimes is called rescaling anomaly. The wave function renormalization factor CW 
can be obtained by simply looking at the kinetic term of the gay genome. So you just read it of the gay genome superfield. If you read it, you will see that this is just 1 over g squared because we know the way we normalize it, okay? Right. Now, you see, this is important. Now we do part integral over VC. But here is GVC, GVC. It's a complex conjugate, okay? So, to have next step. To have a canonical normalization, for the vector multiplet, we must have this is canonical normalization, right? So 1 over g square equal to the real part of tau over 4 pi i plus tau of adjoint, t of adjoint, sorry, 8 pi square log zw. Okay. So what I'm telling you is that if you take real part of this guy in this bracket, this bracket it has to be 1 over g square right this is the definition of canonically normal normalized so this follows no, now you just plug CW to be this guy and recall that ZW is equal to G inverse and square and T adjoint is NC. Okay? Plug it in, you get T a uh, real part of G square minus NC pi square log 1 over G square. Okay? This equation, sometimes people call it Schiffman Weinstein formula, but okay. It's an equation that follows from this derivation. Okay. Now, next step is to use the property of tor. You remember that tor has a very nice um, form in terms of lambda and mu. So, so let me write it down. <coughs> Recall that exponential 2 pi i tor equal to lambda over mu over 3 nc. 3 nc coming from the B0 of the pure super young mills. Okay? And so, minus real part of 2 pi i tor is equal to pi square over g square minus nc log pi 8 pi square over g square plus nc log 8 pi square equal to minus 3 nc log mod lambda over mu.
Mm. Ah, okay. So basically, this is usual. This is usual. Uh, uh, how do you call? Rescaling of the. This is a Jacobian, right? This term due to Jacobian of the path integral. Okay. This part you agree. The point is that it introduced the usual wave function renormalization. Wave function renormalization, you just look at Lagrangian in front of uh, the, the W, right? Because this is fermion. Yeah. And this turned out to be this guy. Now, once you obtain this, you use this uh, result. You can, you see, now you have this equality. Right? You agree? This is in this is G, this is G, this is mu. In order to, to get beta function, you just differentiate re with respect to log mu, right? So differentiate. Uh eating with respect to log mu, we obtain. So this line and this line, okay? So you get beta of pi eight pi square over g square minus n c over eight pi square over g square. You might wonder why I write it in the, this form because I want to obtain this beta function. It's easier to write in this form first, okay? Times beta of eight pi square over g square equal to three and c. You agree with this line? So from the second equality, uh, from the first equality, differentiate with respect to uh, log mu. This is the beta. Okay. Simplify, you get a better function, right? <coughs> so we thus arrive at the SS NSVC. Beta function for 